Thank you, Tim, Jim. That was an excellent presentation. And yes, no flashing of cards. It was great. <laughs> Our second presentation this morning, Vaccine Hesitancy and Health Promotion, will highlight some concerns individuals have about immunization and identify strategies in dealing with issues relating to vaccine hesitancy. I have the good fortune to now introduce you to our next presenter, Dr. Taj Jadavi. Dr. Jadavi joined the Faculty of Medicine, University of Calgary, where he founded the Pediatric Infectious Disease Division at Alberta Children's Hospital. He was appointed head of the Pediatric Infectious Disease Division and held this position until, 19, or until 2004. Professor Jadavi was Director, Postgraduate Pediatric Program, Faculty of Medicine from 1990 to 1999 and was also Director, Pediatric Infectious Disease Program from 1988 to 2000. In 2001, he was appointed Associate Dean, International Health. Since 1990, Professor Jadavi has been a member on the Board of Examination at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. He has maintained a very busy consultation practice in infectious disease at Alberta Health Services. Recently, he was awarded the Medal for Distinguished Service by Alberta Medical Association. Please join me in, warming, in providing a warm welcome to Dr. Taj Jadavi. Good morning. Thank you, Pamela, for that generous introduction. I would like to thank the organizing committee for having me to speak on this important topic of vaccine hesitancy and health promotion. Now, unfortunately, when Marilyn wrote to me, uh, she did not uh, tell me that, well, my time is only 25 minutes. Uh, I thought it was an hour, and uh, then we negotiated. It came to 35 minutes, and just before the presentation, she cut it down to 25 minutes. <laughs> so that is about 30% reduction, you know. So you know what that means. That means that I have to put everything in fast forward. Uh, so if I speak uh, too fast, uh, it's her fault. Uh, <laughs> if she shows me card, I can't read. So I should be okay. Now, most of you know, you know, that uh, vaccine hesitancy or anti-immunization is not a new phenomenon. It has been there since the introduction of the vaccine almost a century ago. But what happened was, you know, at that time, there was a chattering, and that chattering was confined to a small group. But it was not effective. The reason it is not effective is because they were seeing people getting these diseases. They were dying, both adults and, uh, and, and children. But the difference now is that that chattering has become infectious and it has become pandemic. To give you an example, while I'm giving this talk, somebody in the audience is twittering to a friend in Windsurf, Manitoba, of what I'm speaking. It is that infectious. You don't even have to come close to somebody. And in fact, you know that, remember when Jenny McCarthy appeared on Oprah Winfrey, when she talked about the MMR and autism, there was somebody sitting in Timbuktu who also heard the same story. So this has become a major issue for us. Issue in the sense, you know, that, well, now, we are not seeing the disease. So people have forgotten that. Dr. Kellner showed you all those slides that the impact has been phenomenal, which is true. In the Google generation, in the dot-com generation, you can talk to them about measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria. That's not what their interest is. Their interest is about the vaccines and the risk of the vaccines. And I think, you know, that when people talk about the hesitancy and we, we develop strategies, we develop strategies talking to them about the risk of the infection. And they are not interested in that. They are more interested in the risk of the vaccine. And I think, you know, we have to develop strategies which are effective strategies. And I'm sure, you know, that you will hear 
Tomorrow, my fellow, you know, Cora Constantinescu is going to make some presentation about how we should be doing these things, you know, that we need to really move along and make some changes there. So disclosure, yes, I've received uh, honorarium from different companies. My objectives for this talk is to summarize concerns parents have about vaccines, to highlight what happens when children are not immunized, and to develop strategies in dealing with vaccine hesitancy group. Now, remember, this is not parents only. It is much more than parents. And when we talk about parents, it may not be both parents. It may be one parent. In fact, I'll tell you a story. Just recently, in my clinic, I had a four-year-old boy who came to see me because of cellulitis on his leg. And, you know, taking a full history, part of it is immunization. So I asked mom in, during my history taking that if the child is immunized. And she said, no. And I said, what's the reason? She said, no, 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 he's immunized, but we are using homeopathic immunization. Now, I don't know what homeopathic immunization, you know, and really, I, 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 I don't know that. So I asked her the question, madam, you know, I really do not know what homeopathic immunization is. Can you please explain to me? And she really got mad with me. And husband was sitting there and said that, well, you can deal with him because I'm not here, you know, to talk about this. And she stomped out. So I, I told Mr. Smith, I said, uh, Mr. Smith, I'm sorry, you know, this is part of my medical training that I have to be thorough in my history and all that. And I apologize, you know, that your wife got uh, upset about this. He said, don't worry about this, you know, because I think my children should be immunized. <laughs> I said, wow, this is a great opportunity for me, you know. <laughs> I, I told him, I said, you know what? You know, just a few months ago, I saw a two-year-old two, two who was admitted to our ICU in the hospital, you know, and he died of meningitis which could have been prevented because those parents also didn't believe in immunization. He said, he died of meningitis? There is a vaccine for that? I said, yes. I said, listen, you know, I'll give you my number. You don't need a referral from your doctor, you know. Maybe go and talk to your wife, you know, and if you think about coming back to me, why don't you come back and we can talk about immunization, you know. And, I, and my secretary got, got a call, you know, and this mother came, apologized for her behavior, and she wanted to know. So remember, you know, that it's not about the parents. But when you're talking to them, you want to make sure both of them are present. Because you don't want to talk to one parent, you know, because maybe that's the parent who is against it. But there are doctors as well, you know, that who think, you know, that, well, maybe immunization is not uh, needed, you know, for some of them. And you will wonder that, really, is this true? I'm telling you there was a referral of a family doctor to my clinic to talk about she not want to use immunization for her children for chickenpox. She said, why should I give chickenpox vaccine to my children when it is such a benign disease? And then we went into it, you know, and when I asked her a question that, well, what is the number one risk factor for, for necrotizing fasciitis in children? She said, I don't know. I said, chickenpox. She said, really? I said, maybe we should immunize our children. You know, so we, we have got groups of people who don't believe. It's not only parents. You know, public health nurses we have seen. We have seen healthcare workers, you know, and, and people wonder that, is it true? Yes. Look at the influenza immunization in our, in, in, in our province, in, in, in healthcare personnel. Very low. Why, why do you think so? Do you think, is it the hesitancy? Or is it something else? It's a hesitancy, you know, because people think, you know, it doesn't work. Policy decision makers are also culprits here. Religious leaders, they are also big influential people in the community, and some of them are against the vaccine or, you know, against the immunization of certain vaccines. And then the celebrities, you know. Can you imagine, you know, Jenny MacArthur on the front page of Family Magazine and Taj Jadavi on the other page, you know? <laughs> Who do you think, you know, that they'll go for? <laughs> I'm not that bad looking. 
So Dr. Kellner showed you this. You know, 10 great public health achievements in the 20th century. Number one, vaccination. Number one. If I ask you what will be number one in the 21st century, what do you think it will be? What do you think? Vaccination. The technology has changed. There are new, new vaccinations. What Dr. Kellner showed you, the list there. You know, we have got lots of vaccine coming. Now we have got vaccines which are going to prevent cancers. More and more vaccines will come. So we are going to see these problems, you know. So remember, you know, that number one will be vaccination too. And this is on your cover page there. In the last 50 years, immunization has saved more lives than any other health intervention. Let me repeat it again. In the last 50 years, immunization has saved more lives than any other health intervention. Do you think, you know, the people who have got vaccine hesitancy believe this? No. You know, because they don't see that, those diseases. He showed you this as well. The impressive thing about this is the impact has been phenomenal. There is no question about that. But we are not seeing those diseases anymore, and people say that, well, this is not an issue anymore. It used to be, but not anymore. I think, you know, that when we, when, when we develop our strategies, we have to develop strategies accordingly. That, well, this is not going to be very effective showing that this number. Well, it has been phenomenal. No question. Every, anybody will tell you. You increase the immunization rate, you decrease the disease. You know, when you increase the coverage for polio, you decrease the rates of polio. The same thing with diphtheria. So the Google generation and dot-com generation born in 1980s, who are 30 years old now, this is really of no effect. They said that, well, we don't see that. Our children are well-fed, healthy. These diseases are not going to affect them. He showed you, you know, Dr. Kellner showed you one slide there, you know, that immunization rate of measles in our province is 85%. Not good enough. You have to have 95% to decrease the breakthroughs. So we have to really make an effort, concerted effort, to make sure, you know, that we don't see these blips of measles, what we saw recently in, in, in Alberta or in other provinces as well. This is an interesting thing, you know, about the Haemophilus influenzae type B. The reason I say it is interesting because when I was doing my fellowship at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, you know, we used to see about 500 cases of Haemophilus influenzae. We introduced the vaccine, you know, the, the first generation uh, Haemophilus in vaccine in the 80s, and then, you know, subsequently introduced the better vaccine from 500 cases now, we see five cases every year in Canada of hemophilus influenza. Five cases. And I can tell you exactly the details about, you know, because I'm part of the impact group, and I can tell you the details of these five uh, children getting the hemophilus influenza type B. Some of them, they don't vaccinate. Some of them are immunocompromised, so they don't, they don't react. But phenomenal impact, you know, that this is something when you talk to parents about preventing meningitis, they will go for it. But tell them we can't give you separate vaccines. You have to get the other ones to get this. We don't have a separate Haemophilus influenza type B uh, vaccine. Parents have got lots of questions, and you have heard about this. Now that the illness have disappeared, do we really need all this vaccine? I showed you that. These are the questions asked. Can some vaccines be delayed until my child is older or spread out over time? Very common question. We don't want to vaccinate younger ones. Since so many other children are immunized, do mine need vaccines? They want to be protected by other people getting or other children getting vaccines. Vaccines contain preservatives and other additives. Are they harmful? We have heard these stories, you know, thimerosal. You know, parents ask us that question all the time. There are so many vaccines, do they overwhelm the immune system or cause long-term harm? Diseases had already begun to disappear before vaccines were introduced because of the better hygiene and sanitation. And that's what they think, you know, that really their children don't need that because we've got good hygiene, good sanitation, good uh, uh, food now, you know, healthy children. 
Majority of the people getting disease have been fully immunized, and I'll come back to that, you know, to show you why they think that. There are many case reports of harmful side effects from vaccine, including deaths. Well, there are side effects, you know. I have never seen deaths with, with vaccine, you know, and I've been practicing infectious uh, disease for almost 30 years now, you know. Yeah, I'm just 45, you know. But, <laughs> but I've not seen that, really, with the vaccine. Questions doctor ask, I told you about the chicken pox. You know, they say it is benign. We used to go to birthday parties. Why are you vaccinating children? They don't understand the complications of chicken pox. The strokes, you know, and the necrotizing fasciitis. Healthcare workers, you know, this is a very common thing about the influenza. That it is not effective. Why should we get it? And the religious leaders ask questions too. HPV vaccine will cause promiscuity in girls, and so this vaccine should not be given. You have heard about that, right? <laughs> Bishop Henry has done that. Catholic schools do not. We have used a strategy, really, you know, Juliet Gorshan used a strategy individually. She has taken up, up on her and went and talked to all of these Catholic schools, telling them about why it is important, you know. Out of 14 Catholic schools not immunizing, 13 of them changed their policy and they have started immunizing. So our strategies have to be different. We have got Mullah. Mullah Omar says, vaccines will sterilize your children, so you should not vaccinate. Have you heard that? I have heard it, and I'll show you. This was in New York Times, India, 2001, 239 cases of polio. India, 2002, 1,509 cases of polio, 86% of the total world cases, 1,197 cases which is 68% of world total, in the state of Uttar Pradesh. Now, I know you are good in geography, but let me just tell you as well, where is Uttar Pradesh? <laughs> Uttar Pradesh is one of the state in India, land mass of 294,000 kilometers square. Alberta has got 662,000 kilometers square. Population of Uttar Pradesh is 166 million. I have not missed the zeros here. It is 166 million. Alberta's population now is 4 million. You can say that, we know. So mostly population in Uttar Pradesh is Hindus, 17% Muslims. Majority of the polio cases occurred in Muslim population. Why? Because Mullah Omar said, don't give this vaccine to your children because you will sterilize them. This is, I'm not telling you, you know, these are not fake stories. These are true stories happening every day in the 21st centuries as well. When I say that people say about, well, it happens in fully immunized uh, children, look at this number, you know. If you've got 1,000 children, 970 had measles vaccine, we know that it is not 100% effective when you give them one dose. And then if there is an outbreak, so 20 of the vaccinated children get ill, and 20 of those 30 who percent, you know, who didn't get the vaccine get. So people said that, well, you know, those people, children who got vaccination, it's the same as those. But look at the difference. But see how they interpret the data. That's where the problem is. What are the consequences of not immunizing children? Really, if you look at the relative risk, and we have got exemptors for many reasons. We have got exemptors in Alberta that don't like to give vaccine, and we accept that. Why do we accept that? You know, on religious background, you know, they say, well, they are a threat to us. They cause threat to everybody. You know, when you don't immunize them, and they get measles, and I've got an immuno immunocompromised grandchild, well, I can tell you, you know, that my, immunocomprom uh, my immunocompromised grandchild is going to die if they come in contact with that missile. I can guarantee you that. Or we'll get complications. And look at the numbers there, you know. So the exemptors, you know, high numbers who don't get the measles vaccine compared to those who are immunized. So there are geographic pockets of vaccine exemptor pose a risk to the whole community. You know, this is true. That small number causes a lot of problems for us. 
And then people said that, well, a lot of others are immunized, you know, so why should we get immunizations? And that's true. Herd immunity is there. But that is not an answer. You have to explain to them, you know. You have to explain to them what will happen if somebody, you know, if we were insulated country, did not allow anybody here, and if we are, our immunization rates are very high, no problem. We get people here, we go outside too. And that's the reason, you know, that, well, they will be the first target in getting that infection. This has been the worst scenario at the end of the 20th century. MMR and autism is a nightmare. And everybody knows the story behind this, you know. And everybody knows what happened. It was a selfish motive. It was trying to make money out of this ploy. You all have to read the story about Wakefield and what he did. Believe me, you know, that this story has caused a disaster for us. So reported 12 children. Remember, this was a case studies, 13 authors. So he published, hypothesis was MMR caused bowel dysfunction, which resulted in neurodevelopment disorders. In 10 of the Wakefield's original 13 authors published a formal retraction. How long after? 1998, he published his first paper. 2004, they realized because everybody was after them. Six years later, this is what they did. They retracted. And you see Lancet. Very reputable journal, retracted the article. Damage has been done. It's too late. And this was all a ploy. Believe me, there were physicians involved, scientists involved, epidemiologists involved, lawyers involved. They wanted to make mega bucks on this. So to do that, it took many, many, many years to unfold that, well, that is not true. So remember, case reports and case series, it's a descriptive suggest and association, but cannot be used for hypothesis te testing. That's what Wackfield did. And then good scientist really produced a good paper saying that there is a lack of as association between measles virus vaccine and autism with entropathy, a case control study. And these were, you know, people who, who wrote this article. These are well reputable people, you know, and so there is a strong evidence against an association of autism and MMR vaccine. And then thimerosal as well. When people have looked at good studies saying that whether this really gives you uh, or, or produces uh, autism, no relationship at all. When you look at methodological score in the studies which are there, where you find out, you know, that, well, really does not cause. But look at the bottom there. Son and father partnership wanted to make money on this, and still they are doing it. And look at their scores, you know, and they said that, well, they, are, they support the relationship of this. So what happened to autism rates when thimerosal was removed from vaccines, you know? So three countries did that. Denmark did it. Canada did it, and that's the flashing light, what you see on the map there. What happened? 1992, Denmark, they removed thimerosal, autism rates increased. Canada removed it in 1996, autism rate increased. USA removed it in 2001, autism rate in increased. What does it tell you? We should put thimerosal back. Really, <laughs> show it to them. Tell people who use, the, you know, who bring questions about thimerosal, you know, tell them, you know, this is what I'm showing you. We should put it back. It has, it has increased. And then this thing comes, you know. You know really, you know, and I, I, I think we have to, we have to use the strategies, you know. When Jenny McCarthy came on Oprah Winfrey, we should have a, a champion coming on Dr. Phil's program. Dr. Phil is pro-vaccination, you know, and he will support you that. We didn't do that. 
we could have come on Dr. O's program. Everybody sees that, you know, Dr. Field's program and Dr. O's program, and, you know, we left it alone. And even after showing you all that evidence, she says, no, that doesn't, you know, doesn't make any difference. Look at my child who has got autism. That is most important. But this is what she's blaming it on, the vaccine. Now, think about this. Jenny McCarthy coming on one uh, fa family magazine, and I come here. Nobody is going to buy that magazine, right? <laughs> but when I looked at this again, I said, gee, you know, I don't look that bad. <laughs> I'm a pretty good-looking guy, you know. <laughs> well, how to communicate, you know. An understanding of what influences parents' perception is a prerequisite for effective communication. We also know literature tells us that they trust us. They trust the physicians, that they trust the healthcare. And if you really put it to them properly, they will take your advice. Communication is the key. Speech or writing should be simple. It should be direct. It should be clear. It should be brief, sincere, unambiguous, and targeted. You all agree with that, right? You all agree with what I showed you about MMR and thimerosal. You are convinced. Look what happens. This is the Immunization Safety Review Committee of Institute of Medicine. They came up with this statement. The committee concludes that evidence favors rejection of causal relationship between thimerosal-containing vaccines and autism and MMR vaccine and autism. In the absence of experimental or human evidence, that vaccination, either the MMR vaccine or the preservative thimerosal, affects metabolic, developmental, immune, or other physiological or molecular mechanism that are related causally to the development of autism. The committee concludes that the hypotheses generated to, de to date are theoretically only. <laughs> Do you understand this? I read a few times. I don't understand this. I tell people that we have got strong evidence. It doesn't. They, they show me this statement. One of the prominent infectious diseases in Canada, Noni MacDonald, wrote this. A thorough review of the research involving people and animals provides no evidence that measles, mumps, rubella vaccine causing, causes autism. However, because the causes of autism are unknown, research on autism needs to continue. You understand this, right? Everybody will understand. Language has to be clear, unambiguous, direct, simple. This is what should be written. So the, we know when you are communicating, the gap between how scientists explain health risk and what the public believe, we focus on statistic of vaccine eff effectiveness and risk of the disease. So we think about the risk of infection. We consider the risk of vaccine very small. They think about risk of vaccines. We have to emphasize that. Why is communi communication so difficult? You know, little public memory of the vaccine preventable illnesses. I told you about the Google generation and the dot com generation. They've never seen that. Medical students have never seen this. We go and give them lectures about this. That's what they know. They've never seen these diseases. Power of temporal association, rarity of adverse events, and lack of explanation as to the mechanism. So public focus on vaccine risk, individuals perceive risk differently, and mistrust on the medical system. And remember, when we are talking about anti-vaccination parents or the hesitancy, there are three groups, parents' hesitance regarding vaccines, parents willing to accept some vaccines, you know, so those are easy ones. So we are talking about maybe about 10 to 14 percent fall into those two categories. And parents completely refuse vaccination falls into about 6 percent. We may think it's a small number. If we don't do anything, that number will keep on increasing every year. And when you look at the concerns, the concerns are very similar in the three groups. 
When you look at where they get that information, it is very similar in all the three groups. Friends, relatives, internet, traditional media, celebrities, anti-vaccine websites. How many of you have been on the anti-vaccine websites? What do you think? How powerful it is? Where do they get money from? <laughs> to have that powerful website, try to, where is, uh, you know, Alberta Health Services people are here. Ask them, you know, that really if you want to develop a good website, how much it cost? It cost a lot. Who is giving them that money? Anti-vaccine group. It's not the mothers. They don't have money. Who do you think is giving them money? It's not Jenny McCarthy. Let me tell you that. <laughs> Who do you think gives them money? It's the lawyers. They make our money out of this. It's the lawyers who are putting money into this. Common theme is very similar. They talk about good health, clean water, breast milk, good living standards. All, all the same groups, you know, they, they talk about the same thing. That's the reason our children are not going to get the disease. So the communication strategies communicate existing knowledge, recognize factors that influence parents, perception of risk and their concerns, provide information at appropriate time and in meaningful manner, engage parents in decision making, be patient and listen. And in conclusion, all who deal with immunization have the responsibility to be knowledgeable about immunization, to be aware of their benefits and risk, and to be able to advocate effectively and clearly for their appropriate use. Complacency in this matter will be detrimental to our children and society as well. There are lots of resources, you know, and you probably will get it later on. I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Pamela thought that I was serious when I, when I said I can't read, you know, that's why she never showed me that. <laughs> I will be here to answer easy questions for you. <laughs> so. Thank you very much, Dr. Jadavi. I was just sort of reaching for that little note, but I was a little hesitant.